which one has the greater authority and the most long-term enduring influence, a king or a prophet? Alex Berry Phillips with 10 minute tour, day number three, the tour portion, Korak. We don't seem to be able to get out of Numbers chapter number 16, so let's go back there one more time. And it says in verse 16, Then Moshe said to Korak, Tomorrow you and all your company shall be there before Yahweh, you and they and Aaron, and take each one his fire holder, and you should put incense in it. And let each one bring his fire holder before Yahweh, 250 fire holders, and you and Aaron, and each one with his fire holder. So each one took his fire holder, put fire in it, laid incense on it, and stood at the door of the tent of appointment with Moshe, Near Rome, Cork assembled all the congregation against them against him at the door of the tent of appointment. Then the esteem of Yahweh appeared to all of the congregation. Oh no, not going to be good. Kings and prophets. We see throughout Israel's history the very important role that each of these play. And it would seem at times that prophets acted as kings, and then there are times that kings had a gifting of prophecy. Uh, David seems to be an example of that. So there can be the blending over of the two giftings and callings, but primarily the two offices are separate. Let's examine a king. A king has the authority to demonstrate power. That is, he has the authoritative power to lead an army, to raise up an army, to formulate a plan of attack and go against an opposing nation. The king has authority and power to tax the people to meet the needs of the kingdom. They can seize their adversaries and imprison them, or if they so deem, they have the power, the authority to cut off their heads. And that was demonstrated multiple times. However, though a king lives in power and authority and all who are under his rule and sovereignty should have a healthy and respectful sovereign fear of him, when he's dead, no one fears him anymore. So, uh, as it has been recently said concerning uh, the transition of power in the monarchy of England, the queen is dead. Long live the king. No one is fearing anything from Queen Elizabeth anymore. Now the eyes are upon the throne at which King Charles sits. We'll see if anyone actually fears him or not. But nevertheless, there is that transition of power. One monarch's gone. The next one takes its place, and on we go. Let's look at the prophet. A prophet leads primarily by influence. That is, they have this, this gifted ability to hear and discern very clearly the voice of Yah. And having heard that voice, then they are oftentimes given instructions as to where to go and who to speak this message to. They have this ability to look at times into the future and to begin to decree certain events that will indeed take place. When those events take place, then their credibility uh, it just goes through the roof. So uh, they have this ability to influence. They can walk in, as Nathan did to David, and say to him, you are the man, and cause the king to fall on his face and repent. He has the ability to say, don't go this way, go that way. Uh, king, uh, not king, but the prophet Eliyahu, Elijah, uh, had the ability to influence reigns. Eli, Eli, uh, Elisha, if I can get that out, also had such influence even over sovereigns. Um, even though they're dead, even now to this day, their words still carry weight. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Zechariah, these prophets, Daniel especially, their words still shape opinions and focuses even to this day. So even after they're dead, their words have influence and cause people to live in fear of what it is that they might have said. 
considered that Eldad and Medad were found to be in the camp prophesying. Moshe had called for these 70 men to come to him and to receive an outpouring of his own anointing. Moshe was able to give of his own anointing to others without diminishing that which he held personally. It was a transference of an ability and power without diluting his own. These two men, Eldad and Medad, they uh, prophesied in the camp. But if they were prophesying under the influence of what Moshe had given to them, then there was no competition. They're prophesying the same thing. So prophetic influence, once it's given and shared and adhered to, the influence only grows wider. Such is the difference. Now, in the case where Korak is opposing Moshe, he's not opposing him as a prophet. His words were, you've lifted yourselves up above the assembly. You've taken on too much authority and too much power. When he uh, sought to have a conversation with Dothan and Aviram, they said, we're not coming up and talking to you. And one of the things is that they asked, would you bore out the eyes of these men? Are you going to use kingly authority and physically punish these people because they disagree with you? If Korak and his assembly had succeeded in disposing of uh, Moshe and Aaron's power to lead and to have kingly authority, and Moshe was acting as king, also as prophet, if he opposed him as a king, then likely Moshe and Aaron would have been stoned and killed. So this was no small matter. Moshe did not respond to them in kingly authority. He responded to them in prophetic anointing. He says, bring your fire holders here and act as priest before Yah. And let Yah determine who it is that he accepts. That's in the role of a prophet. He goes to the company of the, uh, the congregation, and he says in verse 24, move away from around the tents of Korak, Dothan, and Aviram. And he separated the people, and then he began to prophesy. He said, don't touch anything that pertains to them. And he says in verse 28, By this you know that Yahweh sent me to do all these works. That these are not from my own heart. These are men. They die as all men do. If they're visited as all men are visited, then Yahweh has not sent me. But he says, if, the, if Yah opens up the earth or its mouth and swallows them and all that belongs to them and they go alive down into Sheol, then you know that these men have scorned. They didn't scorn me. They scorned Yah. So it came to be, as all these words were spoken, that the ground under them split, the earth opens up its mouth, it swallows the people and shuts up over top of them, drowning out their screams of terror as they go down alive into the earth. Moshe withstood the accusations and the insults by prophetic anointing. When this earth-swallowing thing took place, fire shot out of the, the Mishkan, the tabernacle, and consumed the 250 men, including Korak, who stood there worshiping with their fire censers, saying, I'm the elect of Yah. Well, it didn't turn out that way. They were consumed. All of this gives me uh, a concern and pause. There are those that uh, would oppose Yah's leadership, yeah, when Yah chooses a man or a woman to stand in a particular office and function, that's Yah's choice. Yes, there are times that people take on roles and responsibilities out of necessity, out of duty, out of sense of responsibility. But when Yah calls someone and he puts them in a place, don't withstand them. It's not that they can't make mistakes. Pray for them. Ask Yah to use them. Now, are we going to live in the day where Yah separates kings and prophets and stands by his man? 
Think on these things, and we'll see you again tomorrow. To then, shalom.